Good morning. How are you guys doing today? I have to say that I have missed you, money makers. Um, today, let's talk about how much you should raise. All right. So this is Peter Thorson. Um, Peter is he he teaches business classes. He is the Senior Director for Business Development and Strategic Partnerships at LifePlan. Their software company is Palo Alto, so maybe you guys didn't recognize that uh, before, but it is LifePlan essentially. And Peter is actually going to share with you some news about this software as well, because he is they're, they're gonna allow you guys to have some access to it. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Peter. Um, he, so like I told you, he works with, with Lion Plants and all of that, but he has also started and sold multiple businesses with revenues over a million dollars. And he has directed strategic partnerships in companies like Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, and he's also organized local startup weekend events and has been a judge on different business competitions. Um, including universities like Rice, Notre Dame, Princeton. Um, he currently teaches at uh, the University of Oregon and Lane Community College. He, he's also a volunteer. Um, he is the past president of the board of director for committed partners for youth in Lane County, uh, which is formerly Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America and board of director of the Boys and Girls Club in Emerald Valley. Um, and one thing that I really like uh, that Peter says is that he likes living in a world where entrepreneurs have a better chance of success. And with that, I am very happy uh, to introduce you to Peter Thorson. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I think I'll probably share my screen so I don't have to tell you to, to click slides, right? See how that goes? Uh, yes, that sounds great. Absolutely. All right. Very cool. Uh, if everyone can see that, let me know. And that's great. And actually, let's, uh, let's take the offer seriously. I welcome uh, interruption. <laughs> I welcome chat. I want to make sure you all are following along, comprehending everything. We're going to put you in a breakout session at the end that's really going to test and make sure everything's sunk in a little bit here. So if that, if that lights a fire under you, uh, let me know in chat if, if, you're, if you're here with me where you're at, maybe uh, you know what your hopes and dreams are a little bit so I can get to know y'all, uh, but otherwise, uh, or unmute and shout something out if you want. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll keep rolling here. Um, so yeah, really the goal today, and, and, and I'll, I'll say this, one of the interesting things about this topic, about this idea of you know how much should we raise? How, when should we raise? What kind of, uh, you know, it, it, this when, if, and how much you raise, it, it's, it's essentially, it instantly becomes a, a very personal topic, right? It's about you. And the first questions most people ask, well, okay, well, what is your current status? What, how far have you come? Have you raised before, right? So I, I've got, how many do I have people? I, so there's 73 people in this room today, so I can't interview each one of you, but that would normally be the way that we would go about this process. And we would apply different kinds of knowledge. But actually an interesting challenge about presenting to a group and then having you all digest what we're talking about is that there are, some standard things to think about. There are some common elements that we can all talk about during today's presentation that you can then apply to how you're going to think about this for your own business. So, you know, determining how much funding you're going to need, um, you know, it can be confusing. This can be like a scary process in some ways. I think uh, I've definitely talked to a lot of people who feel like this is, you know, not for them. This is for other types of businesses or this is for other types of people. But understanding this vast landscape and different options and a lot of the stuff that Robert talked about last week and how it actually applies to you and what kind of financing you can get, what kind of money you can get and when you need it is, I hope, empowering. That's going to be my goal for today. And, you know, again, in chat, in, in uh, just verbalize it if you want. Uh, my challenge to you all and challenge me back on this one is that I think that this can become an empowering process if you actively decline some of these types of funding. Meaning, and what I mean by actively decline is if you know how something works and you know that it's not for you, or you know what the requirements are for a certain type of financing and you know that you don't want to have that be part of your business, 
then that is what we're talking about with actively decline. And the more that you can participate in that, and the more that you can say, I've said no to 40 sources of funding, but I've got one that I could potentially get into if I need to, but I don't want to. Now you're intelligently approaching this entire landscape, that entire spreadsheet that Robert had for you for you last week, and, and thinking about it in a way that adds strategy to your business and, and hopefully added capacity and added safety. Uh, and we'll talk about what I mean by safety there. So again, I want to make sure that I'm empowering you, not, not overwhelming you. Uh, keep the questions coming if it, if it does. I, there might be a time when you're like, gosh, this is too much. Um, but just you know, let it, let it flow over you, but ask the questions as they come in. Also use office hours. If you think that your business is so special and there's no way I could possibly address it, that's great. I, first of all, challenge me with questions today, but Friday we got office hours and we are going to talk about specifics in that time. Um, so again, that idea of intelligently declining is important here, um, but I just you know, want to make sure that you, you feel comfortable, that we're here to do this together, uh, and that frankly, you can participate in this. That's my, that's my, that's my hopefully a reassurance. And uh, I totally stole Robert's slides for this one too, but the, the big warning for today, by the way, and, and I wanna make sure that I, I wanna be clear about this. I am not advocating for any particular source of funding today. Um, I'm not telling you to go sign up for Cabbage right now and, and you know, good luck. Uh, some of these kind of uh, firms out there uh, are maybe more ideal for some and less ideals for others. Uh, if for the most part, outside of uh, grant type funding, uh, the majority of people who are providing finance, financing for small businesses are also trying to make money by doing so. That includes people like some of the nicest angel investors you'll ever meet in your life and incubators and accelerators in some cases that offer equity as part of their programming. So just keep that in mind. If they're trying to make money for, for what, you know, the effort that they're putting in, in some cases, that means that their results or expectations might not be ideal. And that's really one of the things that we want to cover today as well. But it's part of your individual exploration throughout this process. Hopefully, again, there's going to be some complexity to all these elements, but I'm going to keep coming back to this idea that the things that apply to absolutely everybody is, oh, and Felice just asked, what is SMB? So small business, that's what I'm, small to medium business is what I'm talking about when I say SMB, thank you. And if I use any other abbreviations, shout it out in chat, please. See, I promise I'm looking too. Um, but yeah, SMB, small to medium sized business. And I, and I might, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I've got any other abbreviations. I've got one coming up, I promise. Uh, but this is, this is kind of my agenda for the whole day here. And, and, and your need case, the funding source, and your success model are the things that absolutely will apply to anyone who is even considering any type of financing, whether it's in the near-term future, the long-term future, any point in time. How will you approach it? How will you answer questions like, how much should I ask for? When will I ask for it? How do I know what those results might lead to? How can I feel confident going into a room and saying, uh, boy, I, 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 sure do, I, I sure do want $500,000 and I, and I hope I get it. Yeah, but okay, well, what are you gonna do with it? Where's it gonna go? How are you gonna spend it? And how do you know whether it goes to the right places? So these three sort of big elements are what we're gonna focus the most on today. And ultimately the answers to these things, your need case, comes from some type of planning activity, some kind of guessing about the future. The funding source, again, I'm so glad we got this awesome preview last week. You've got a tool that you can use to kind of explore the different options there. So we're probably gonna spend less time on the funding source, but there are some elements to that that are gonna be important to consider in this uh, today. And then your success model. This is actually, the, so, this is so, so important. Your success model, it means, what is it that you're gonna do with this money? How are you going to apply it? How will you know whether you've applied it correctly and whether things are going well over time? And we're going to talk a little bit about how to make sure that you are participating in that rather than just being responsive and, you know, sort of hoping. Uh, I will say, uh, uh, just right off the bat, and I, I said this to the folks uh, before everyone joined, I mean, I any small business I've, uh, I've ever run, I almost always use as kind of a cautionary tale in my mind. Um, if we borrowed money, we, we did what I just recommended you don't do. If it, you know, a lot of times, if you borrow, let's say $50,000 from friends and family, and you hope that your business does well as a result, you might not go to prison as a result, but you might not strategically apply that money in the best possible way. Or you might just succeed, but due to you know, luck and good fortune, rather than really applying that in the best possible way and getting the maximum value out of it. So that's why we want to say, I want to say that these elements apply to 
all types of businesses, everyone here. And again, if you feel like I'm, I'm diverging from your goals in chat, unmute, let's talk. Uh, and let's make sure that we're staying on track here. But that first category, why and when the funding will be used. This is really gonna come back to you and to your own planning capacity. Um, I wanna talk about here the idea of forecasting, and then I wanna introduce this, uh, probably the only acronym in addition to the one I said before, the SMART goals that we'll use here. Um, when we get to the section about funding source, we'll talk about that some more. Um, but really, like I said, you, you've got your list, you've got your spreadsheet. So I wanna talk more about capacity and timeline and how that applies to how much you can ask for. And then the, just the pros and cons of the choices here. Um, and then finally, like, what do you do with that money? How do you apply it? That kind of thing. So that's the agenda. That's how we're gonna roll through all this uh, material. If this seems totally off to anybody, again, let's get into chat and let's talk about it. Um, but so this is, uh, so this is this idea of, of this forecasting element. Um, again, why and when, this is what we kind of want to be thinking about here. And in some cases, this kind of a question can be overwhelming. I've, I've talked to plenty of small businesses who say, well, I'm not in a crisis, which is frankly the best time to be thinking about this. I'm not currently in a crisis. So I don't know, I, I assume if I got a lot of money, I could do something with it, but I'm not really sure. So, you know, they ask questions like, well, why would I ask for money? And Frankly, uh, you know, I've got a couple of messages here and I've got some direct messages as well, but if anyone has an answer to this question right now, why, why would you immediately, in the near future, in, in, the, in your imagination right now, why would you ask for any money ever? For what reason? Can you answer this right now? Drop it into chat if you can, because I want to know. Um, and, and yes, we're going to talk about the forecasting as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so like, let's talk Adrian. about- like, um, oh, Adrienne, yeah. raise her hand. So you're, you're welcome to mute yourself and, and answer the question too. Payroll. Yeah. Payroll. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Product development, marketing, Expansion. operations. Expansion. Love it. Yes. Love it. Good answers. And I assume, you know, for each of you who, who, who said something, R&D, that kind of thing, you know, you've got then your own specific things that apply to your own business. And that's great. Um, Everything I just heard is all valid. And I assume that, you know, something like payroll is either an issue of making sure that you make delivery or if you're an up and running business, making payroll is, you know, the same as staying in business, of course. So that's great. So, yeah, so you really want to, you know, you want to make sure that you've got the reasons that you could possibly ask for money. And again, if, if you're not in a crisis right now, the why and coming up with these reasons to uh, think about why is, is a great time. Now is a great time to be doing this kind of work um, because the, the sort of the failure case is, uh, you know, sort of uh, daunting. In fact, um, you know, a lot of the reasons that people fail as a business, that businesses fail uh, in general, running out of cash and cash flow problems are amongst the highest uh, percentages. Now, both of those can be preventable. And a lot of times, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, experiencing cash flow problems, running out of cash, that kind of thing, these are issues that in some cases can be prevented. And we'll talk about this in one of our, our cases at the end here, when we talk about the forecasting elements. But if something changes, let's say your business is up and running, and you're doing just fine. If something changes in the near term, and you might experience cash flow problems in the first place, frankly, great job identifying that. And you can usually adjust in some way, finding some kind of bridge loan, that kind of thing. And that can help you overcome some of those problems that might cause you to fail. And again, uh, you know, Annie, Annie said this right off the bat. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm here because I want you all to have a better chance of succeeding. This is probably the biggest contribution that a lot of times we can make here is just making sure you don't accidentally or in a uh, sort of inadvertently run out of cash, not as a result of bad business practice, but just as a result of the world changing. Um, and then, so we wanna think about when is the right time. And some people have this kind of included in, in the why part of it, um, but ultimately there are some major types of when. Um, you know, Paul just wrote to open up new markets. Okay, great, does that apply to a when type question? It might. Uh, it might mean that like a new market has become available, you know, some sort of like new opening or some sort of new international trade route or some sort of, you know, new target market has evolved, that kind of thing. So that might be a good reason to ask yourself when and how to get to the point where you're uh, answering the question when. Um, but also, you know, frankly, if you're in an early stage, 
if you need to get from a product that is in a you know, very early stage of development into uh, that sort of later stage, then that's that startup need. And when is whenever that critical inflection point is, whenever that growth point is. Um, but that's true for any stage of business. Figuring out when or when something might be true in the future is really part of what we're going to do today. Uh, I see Kat just use uh, the, 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 the abbreviation SMART goals. And, and I, I, I'll give you all, I, I kind of, for me, I'm, 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 I'm not a big acronyms person, uh, but when it comes to this kind of thing, when it comes to asking about small business lending, I do like to rely on this particular acronym, SMART goals. Uh, and really the goal here is to think about what kind of lending you're going to want, when you want it, why you want it, and apply this to your thinking. I'm going to break each one of these down for you, and we're going to talk about how forecasting can help with this process. So I just want to make sure that this is looking, but this is a great way to just, uh, again, make it simple in your mind how, what you need to be thinking about. So when I, th when I say specific in this context, yes, it's about like, what do I want to accomplish? What is the goal? Like, how is that important? But again, how is it specific to your business? And I don't want to critique a lot of the answers I'm seeing here in the, in the, in the chat and that I heard shouted out. But if, if you as a business owner say, I want to spend it on marketing and customer acquisition, I want you to be more specific when we're in office hours, when you're pitching to an investor. Here, you're great job. You're doing fine. Um, but you're, wanna, you're going to want to get more and more specific. I want to acquire a certain type of customer from a certain type of channel. Uh, I want to get early adopters on board because my marketing has been, you know, very minimal to date, that kind of thing. So specific really does, it means demonstrate your expertise, show what you know about this business and, and really express <laughs> the level of specificity that you can possibly come up with here. Again, if you're really an early stage startup, this might be something that you need help with, need mentoring on and that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I encourage you all to take part in stuff like the, the pitch competition. Partially just because when you pitch your business over and over again, you hear people ask questions after you've said uh, the thing about, you know, that pitch about your business. A lot of times those questions are things that you can then integrate into that pitch and improve it with specificity. Um, measurable, really, I'm going to use uh, the, the idea of key performance indicators here. What are those elements that are important to your business that you can then measure and that you're actually able to measure? Um, I believe Caroline Cummings is a big fan of the phrase, if it's not uh, measurable, it's not worth doing as a business. Uh, that's one way to think about it. But, uh, you know, listen, if you have trouble coming up with ways to measure what it is you're putting out there, then think about that, like use that as kind of a guiding light in terms of what you can improve and what you can learn more about. Uh, attainable. Uh, in this case, really means not just is it literally achievable, like could your business do it, but are you as the person who's sort of going to be steering this ship, are you going to, right? And that's going to be part of, in fact, some of the, the breakout room exercise that we're going to talk about. Um, relevant, now this is going to seem like, you know, this in this, in this investing stage kind of idea or this, uh, you know, sort of funding stage, the relevance is actually in, in a broad sense, we're talking about how does the goal affect the broader goals, but the relevance in this case is, does the money actually solve some specific problem worth solving, right? If you get funding, does something improve? So that's what we mean by relevant. And then time-based, you know, again, that's one of the biggest questions we've got today. When, if you think you might need some funding to grow at some point in the future, that's not very time-based yet, when might you actually want to be asking for that money? Or if it's you know, responding to a potential crisis in the future, when might that crisis occur so that you can get that bridge and stay in business and make sure to make payroll, like someone said? Um, or if you're a startup, when are you going to get to the point where you actually could make best use of that money? So time-based is a, is a difficult question. And again, it's, it's personal. It's different for everyone here. But let's talk about how to get to that point. Ultimately, the starting point here is come up with some kind of forecast, um, you know, come up with that idea, come up with your guess in the future. Now, a baseline forecast, um, I, Annie, Annie mentioned, uh, you know, we make a product called LivePlan. You can create a forecast here, but for a lot of you all, you're going to want to think about the simplest possible, the leanest possible way of thinking about the future. You might just have a few items on a whiteboard. I wish I had a whiteboard here. I, I did at one point. Um, you, you know, you might just have like, I need to make 40 sales by the end of this month. I'm up to 20 and it's halfway through the month. So check. I need to make sure that my costs don't exceed blank. And I need to, you know, make payroll by the end of the month. And that's only a couple people. So piece of cake. So I don't need this to be 
I don't need this to look like anything like your accountant might produce. And in fact, I don't want that. I want you to create a baseline forecast that you understand, um, that you can sort of perceive as something that you can uh, participate in over time. Um, and, then, and then we wanna go through these other steps, identify the potential time for funding, um, and then create a separate forecast that includes that idea of funding. And I'll talk about why I'm asking you to do two different forecasts soon here. Um, and then ultimately step four here is, is decide, like, do you really want this? Okay, do you really want this for yourself? Now, in the case of, I mentioned, there's some like more like crisis reasons to get funding, right? If my business is up and running and I anticipate an issue in the near future where I might go cash, uh, cash negative for a minute, might not be able to make payroll, might not be able to pay the bills, then most people will say, yes, obviously I wanna pursue that path. But if this is funding for potential growth or new development or new product expansion, you know, a lot of people said marketing, that kind of thing, Great, but does that match your entrepreneurial personality? Is that what you really want? So let's break this down a little bit. So when it comes to financial forecasting, again, we've got a tool, you might have a tool. If you've got a spreadsheet, that's awesome. If you love it, uh, we are gonna give you all free access to Live Plan. You can use that if you've never used it before. If you're already using it, we'll give you three months extra, whatever you want here. But the way that we wanna think about financial forecasting is I want to use your own words, you, the business owner. If you have an accountant, you're up and running, use your own words <laughs> to describe those revenue streams. Too many times people get confused by accounting and I don't want that for you. Add some numbers. Again, come up with those revenues, direct costs, those, those things. Again, if you're up and running and you do this a lot, this might, be, this might seem almost rudimentary. If you're in a startup phase, this might seem like, oh my God, I'm just making stuff up. Yeah, anytime we, we guess about the future, we're making stuff up. And I'm gonna keep reassuring you about that. I'll probably say that 10 more times. Um, but then you wanna do things like reality check. You know, you wanna bring the work that you've done to programs like this or mentors like this or office hours like we have on Friday. Um, and then duplicate that forecast. <laughs> Take a copy of it and make some assumptions about what might happen if you get some kind of funding. Again, it might be a bridge loan. It might be a massive growth loan. It might be $2 million for you know, massive product build and lots of marketing, that kind of thing. Uh, and then again, like, do you want that? Like start to perceive what you want. So the result of what I'm talking about might look something like this. And we'll dig into this case a little bit here. But if, you know, before getting, uh, in this case, let's say it's an equity investment, before getting that, my year four uh, looks like, you know, 500K. And maybe I'm happy with that business model. But what I'm exploring is what if I get this like $1 million investment in year two that helps me build product and expand uh, my marketing and sales capacity to get more customers, well, then my growth actually can accelerate even faster. And by later years, I'll have far more revenue, far more employees, far more responsibilities, far more stress. Maybe I don't want this at all, even though everything looks like it's great. It's going up and right, and there's a huge increase. Do I want that? Do I not want that? That kind of thing. So again, that's where it becomes personal and part of your own entrepreneurial goals and personality. Peter, question. Yes. Um, is, are you in favor of creating three scenarios, worst case scenario, typical, and then the best case scenario when you're doing this forecasting? Yeah, I, it's so funny. I, I, I always like try to, I, I try to lighten the load here and make it feel like I'm not really asking you all to make multiple forecasts, but that's really what I'm asking you all to do. Um, it's, that's really, it, I think that's a very personal question in some ways. I'll, uh, I'll tell one quick story. Um, we mentioned the, the Boys and Girls Club here in, in, in Eugene, we call it Emerald Valley. Um, our CEO just didn't relate to the forecast that we had created for years. We weren't really sure why, but it just, it always kind of felt like, well, there's this, this, this future, and of course I want to get there, but of course I just want to do as best as I can. So the, the future looking forecast always just felt like, yeah, that's what I'm waking up and I'm doing. I can't, what's the point of this kind of, like that was his response to it, until we made a worst case scenario. And, and in that case, the worst case scenario was kind of like, what's the minimal, like what's the worst we can do right before we have to close the doors and not serve any kids in this nonprofit, right? And for some reason, for his psychology, this makes him feel better about the idea that if he runs lower than that amount, if he get, does worse than the worst case scenario, then that's a crisis and he needs to be talking about it. But as long as he outperforms that, he can like, you know, at noon, he can say, great, I, I, I've done it. <laughs> Job well done. I've, I've achieved something here and can kind of move on and relax. So it's an interesting approach. Um, I do love the idea of having multiple forecasts uh, and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. 
So as you all are doing this, if you've never written a forecast before, um, if this is your first time or if you want some review here, here's some tips that I've got. Um, I want you to make sure to limit your revenue streams. When you're thinking about where that money is coming from, if you're you know, starting a, a store with lots of items on the shelf, you wanna make sure that you're really categorizing them. The reason I'm saying limit those items, and first of all, don't duplicate your accounting data. Accounting is accounting. Collapse that into as few items as you can come up with. The reason is you wanna be able to make sure you're using your own words. If I'm in a restaurant, I might sell entrees, appetizers, and drinks. Okay, great, maybe stop there. There's a lot of variation in those categories, but average them out so that you can make a quick forecast so that you can do this quickly and easily and get on to the other scenarios. And also remembering that you're gonna, in step three, you're gonna be changing this forecast over time. The world's gonna change, your guess is gonna change, everything's gonna change around it. So you need to make sure that you're flexible enough. And if your revenue forecast has a hundred items, you're never going to change it, certainly not on a monthly basis. And you're going to get a headache when Annie says, oh, should we make another? Well, let's make another forecast. Let's make a work scenario. Let's make a best case scenario. So again, you want to make sure you, yeah, you want to make sure that you are uh, you're keeping this categorized and everything like that. I'm just making sure here to look through chat. Um, so just that, for example, if this is your, you, if you're a startup and this was, you know, I made a couple sales and I went to this conference, I went to this other conference. If my revenue forecast stops here, I'm not really providing any intelligence to a potential investor. If, for example, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm at capacity. This is the most I could ever make. This is the most product I could ever output right there at the top. And in fact, I kind of want to come down a little bit because I'm not comfortable at that throughput. I was, I was working all weekend. Uh, that's one type of forecast that tells a lot about a business type. And this is another type of forecast that would indicate that, oh, I'm actually looking for growth here. And at this inflection point is when I would want to see funding and have that growth come in. And I see some questions here. Um, forecasting is eye opening. Yeah, uh, and, and Elizabeth, it looks like you're asking about how do we like make sure that we're getting the subscription. Yeah, we'll we'll do that after today. Um, I wanted to make sure I didn't feel like I'm not trying to shill for our own product here, but I do want to make sure that this is something you can do again. Whiteboard, our app, napkin back, whatever you've got. Uh, but the tips are going to apply regardless of how you do that. Um, when it comes to the expenses, the major things you really want to always think about are just those raw everyday expenses, you know, rent, utilities, that kind of thing, but then direct costs. Uh, if you have no idea what direct costs are, they're a way of just expressing your understanding of whenever you sell something, it always costs you some amount. Um, if I sell boxes of cereal and every box I get costs me 50 cents and I sell the box for $2, my direct cost for each $2 sale is 50 cents every single time. Okay, so just understanding the difference between those direct costs will show that you have a certain intelligence about your business model, but also again, add to that you know, nature of what it is you're forecasting, uh, how you're producing this forecast. So yeah, I mentioned this is probably gonna be the last time I really dump a lot of uh, abbreviations here, but COGS, which is the cost of goods sold or direct costs. Uh, what else do we see? We see call COGS, direct costs, something else. Um, and then other key performance indicators might be important for you depending on your business, but customer acquisition cost and lifetime value might be two values that are really an important part of your overall business. Uh, someone just said, can I go into more detail on LTV lifetime value? Uh, the good news, okay, great. Yeah, if, if lifetime value confuses you, the, the good news is there's a very easy way to think about it. And I hope this helps. Lifetime value is quite simply, the amount of money that you will make from a given a single customer throughout their experience with your product with one experience okay now it, it can get a little confusing because well what do you mean experience well if i sell a box subscription and you subscribe to that box and most people say subscribe between like one year and two years the lifetime value is just the average of that customer's lifespan, how long they stay subscribed, times the amount of dollars I charge them during that time, okay? If I am a one-time, uh, you know, uh, sort of, a, if I'm a one-time purchase uh, type product, let's say, you know, I, I sell used cars and, and most people just literally purchase one car, the lifetime value might literally be, you know, the average price of the car and that's it. And I say LTV is just the number, uh, the number of dollars I make per, uh, per person. And so how do you measure it? Well, 
you do have to have some knowledge of how your customers interact with your product, right? You have to understand their life cycle in relation to what you're offering. Um, and, and does this recur to, uh, only apply to recurring revenue? These questions are awesome. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> good question. So lifetime value uh, certainly is, is, is in some ways easily understood when it's a subscription model, but lifetime value absolutely applies to uh, single sale things or like, let's say I'm a massage therapist and I have like one type of LTV, one type of lifetime value, uh, and, and I'm about to address Kat's question, one type of lifetime value where certain customers come in and they do one session and I never see them again. So the lifetime value of that person is one times the prize, the price of, of the product. Do I measure present value terms, not absolute dollars? I do absolute dollars, uh, Ron. And again, it's an average per type of customer. So that's one type of customer for that massage therapist. What if I have a lot of repeat customers and those repeat customers on average come back twice a month on average for maybe a year of their lives? Okay, well, that's now, first of all, I'm demonstrating knowledge. I have two types of customers, two types of personas. And one, the LTV is, let's say $200 because it's one session times $200. And the other is two times a month times 20 uh, times 12 months times that 200. So $4,800. And again, now I'm demonstrating that these two customers have different values. And when I talk about the customer acquisition cost, who do I want to spend money on advertising to? I hope it's clear that I want to spend money on advertising to the type of person, the persona who might come for an entire year, come twice a month. And the one-time customers, I hope they flood in. I don't want to say no to them, but maybe they're less valuable in terms of spending money to acquire. This all translates to, if I want to get a loan to acquire more customers, the lender will want to see <laughs> that I'm acquiring customers of that high value type rather than that low value type, okay? I'm going to keep moving here, um, but this is kind of that notion of expenses. I think I've skipped a couple questions over here. Please shout out if, uh, you know, uh, if, if I'm missing anything. And I see some stuff in here. Yeah, uh, customer lifetime value. It's, it's really just the, the, the lifespan, the, the amount of times they do the uh, purchase times the actual value, the dollar value. Um, one more thing, by the way, there is a good ratio for, for anyone who's a startup here. Uh, if your customer acquisition cost is about a third of the lifetime value of your potential customers, and again, you all are probably guessing if you're in startup mode or you're thinking about the future in a different way, uh, that's a good ratio. Three to one is a good ratio when you think about expenses. Also, if you're a startup, by the way, when it comes to expenses, common startup mistake or common like first time creating a forecast mistake uh, is you underestimate the expenses. So, uh, you know, I think we provide slides after today. Feel free to use any table like this or just look up on the internet, you know, common expenses. If you're forecasting for the first time and you don't know what kinds of expenses to include, you know, use, use some resources because a lot of times they're pretty common. So again, we've got now we've got this concept. We've got our initial forecast, right? And we talked about this idea of multiple forecasts. Well, now we've got an initial forecast that just demonstrates that I understand my current business model. A lot of up and running businesses have never created a forecast. And so if you've never done this before, that's okay. I look out on the main street and I see plenty of businesses who wake up in the morning, hope that they make enough sales, get to the end of the day, they made enough sales to stay in business and they say, great, I hope I do better tomorrow. And that's their entire method of forecasting. It's all instinct. But a lot of that instinct can be written down. A lot of your knowledge that you have and that you maybe think that you aren't that smart about, you're actually super intelligent about, probably more so than 99% of people out there because you spend so much time thinking about this work that you do. Write it down, take a second forecast and start talking about this growth plan. So this is where it gets extremely personal. Okay, when the idea of a growth plan uh, starts to apply to your business, I can't really tell you what to do, but there are some commonalities here. If your goal is customer growth, marketing, sales, I think a bunch of people shouted that one out, that's great. That's when you need to start thinking about that customer acquisition cost. For everyone who comes in and purchase, how much did you spend to get that person to come in and purchase? This can be extremely difficult if a lot of your marketing efforts are broad. If all of my marketing efforts are, well, my, my store exists on, on Main Street, so that's kind of a marketing, people see me, so that's a marketing effort, and I have these three billboards around town. Gosh, it's really, honestly, it's going to be hard to calculate your overall customer cost, and you might do it on essentially an annual basis. I spend this much on overall marketing, and I've gotten this many customers by the end of the year. 
So maybe if I double that, I could double my customers. It's more difficult. If I sell stuff online and all of my customers come to my website and buy online and I pay a certain amount to get those customers to my website, it's much more clear. And I can do a per customer analysis uh, like I was talking about before. If we want to, however, completely different approach. If I want to sustain a difficult era, and we're going to talk about this in the case, if I've got like, oh my gosh, that worst case scenario, I've got this like one thing that could go wrong. And if it goes wrong, I'm definitely going to need to get a loan to stay alive for that, for that period of time. That's a completely different approach. So think about that. And if you've never thought about asking for money in the future, if your business is totally fine and you're just happy with what you've got going on, this is a good type of forecast to create for yourself. Again, for reassurance, that kind of worst case scenario. Um, but if you're talking about like product launch or product delivery or filling your inventory, again, that's a different type of lending. It's a different type of second forecast that you're going to create here. And then finally, the timing, a lot of in a lot of cases, when we say, when are we going to ask for this money, based on what we just did, that work that we just did, creating that first forecast and then creating that second one, the timing will often fall into place. But again, using those three cases, if your goal is customer growth, you know, when do you want to start that process? Are you equipped to support the new customers? Do you have you know, the marketing team in place? Are you going to do it all yourself? That kind of thing is what you want to be asking. If you're sustaining that difficult time, if you're planning for a worst case scenario in the future, now is a great time to be conservative. What's the really the worst case scenario? And how much would you need to fill that in? If you can pay your loan back faster than you think, that's great. So be conservative if you think about those worst case scenarios in the future and really don't wait. Do not wait until you're already mid-crisis <laughs> to start thinking about a crisis situation for the first time. Again, for everyone here who's comfortable, is maybe leaning back and not really thinking too much about what I'm talking about here today, my assignment for you, my homework for you, Think about those worst case scenarios that might happen. How might you run out of money? How might you become one of those unfortunate businesses that just ran out of cash one day? And what might you do if you see that coming, if you foresee that event? And how could you use funding to help you avoid doing that? And then finally, you know, again, this idea of this new product launch, this is really where you want to demonstrate that expertise. And you know, in this case, demonstrating expertise means, you know, uh, you're, you're expressing that industry knowledge that you have. If you're talking about filling an inventory, we're so personal, right? We're talking about you specifically. If we're talking about delivery or new product launch, like now you're probably talking about how long it takes you to, to code your app or how long it takes you to, to sew one uh, of these rugs. And when you get the new machine, how fast you're going to be able to do it. And you'll be able to do 10 times the output. This is where things can get really nerdy and you get really excited about stuff. So have fun with that if that's the way you're going. Um, and then finally, this is a step I think most people skip. I'm so glad you all are here because you're meeting all sorts of mentors who can help you with this. If you've created a forecast for your business that's going to go forward and you've created a forecast of this, what if, like, what if my future went this other way, or I got this other funding that I need? Well, how do you check that? And sometimes industry research is a great way to do that. If industry research doesn't really do that for you, if it's hard, or if, if you don't really understand, or it doesn't really apply to you, can you do competitive research? How many people here have bought a competitor's product just to see what it feels like, just to see how fast they deliver it? Has anyone ever walked into a competitor's, I actually see people's hands raising, great. Anyone like, I, I, I talked to, a, after having a similar talk with somebody, I, I talked to a person who was opening a, a bakery, I, I don't want to say too much, uh, and she said, well, there's this one place that does what I'm doing. And I said, okay, great, well, what, and, 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 have, we, have we looked at it? She goes, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, after, you, after we talked, I spent an entire a full day inside, after making my forecast, I spent a full day inside their place, and I was able to see Am I able, is my average register ring what I think it might be? How many customers came in and out? Which, yeah, to call it spying. I mean, literally, if it feels a little uncomfortable, I, I challenge you all to feel a little uncomfortable for this stage. Uh, don't, don't make it weird or gross. I've heard of some people like applying for jobs at competitors. That's, I don't know, up to you guys. That's not, not illegal, but maybe a little further than I'm talking about. But if you can get, yeah, secret shopper, if you can get more information through totally reasonable ways that don't, you know, hurt your competitors, I, I say go for it. Like use the landscape as a way of developing knowledge that otherwise is not available to you. 
You're comparing it to your forecast because how else do you know if your goals are relevant? How else do you know if you can create this forecast that actually makes any sense? How else will you know what time-based really means in these continue? So this is how you kind of like test. You, you, you've spitballed something with your forecast uh, and, and now you're kind of like testing that against reality in some way. Um, anyway, this is great. Uh, I, I, we mentioned earlier, so I, I've been talking about how to do these kinds of forecasting. Uh, everyone here who wants it, you can have access Three months free of live plan if you've already got a subscription or you had one in the past we can just update your account so i'll do that by email afterwards but when it comes to this forecasting process in this particular app it's just very easy you can see we've got you know a few categories here that uh that you can you know do your revenue forecasting you can add as many as you want you've got expenses and personnel and that kind of thing all, all, you know, sort of step by step and very guided. And within the app, you can make multiple scenarios. In this case, I have a silly amount of scenarios um, because I, you know, use this as a demonstration model here. Um, but the other thing, of course, that's key here, I've made one uh, sort of working forecast, and then I can create another scenario and add financing. Okay, and we'll see the results of what I've done with this company and with some other companies in this app when we get to the case section. So I want to make sure that we're going to actually do that here. Um, so that's kind of the quick summary there of the why and when. Again, we can spend hours on this and individually I could do all of these same ideas, but for you in particular. But I think the big picture of what we just talked about applies to everyone here. And if not, not at all. If this isn't for you at all, uh, drop it in the chat. Let's let's see if we can challenge ourselves to make sure that what we're talking about is good. Peter, um, it looks like yeah. Adrienne has her hand up. Um, sorry, I didn't see feel, you. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, that's from before. I apologize. All good. All right. So we'll call it a high five then. Just whoosh, like that, right? Exactly. <clears throat> yes. So, someone Peter, said something. Yeah, Peter, uh, I think I had put that in question. How important it is to go digital right on day one, then in the you know, in the future, go through a digital transformation. Uh, I'm again relating it back to everything being measurable and right, doing that yeah. right from day one. Yeah, great question. It, it, it absolutely depends on the business, of course. But I mean, I don't know. It's it's a funny question to me personally. I mean, I've been in what I call tech my whole life. Um, but isn't everything tech nowadays? I almost feel like someone like me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been in tech forever. But everyone is now in tech on some level. I mean, Going digital, uh, you know, and I'm not I'm not trying to critique what you just said, but for some businesses, let's say I I the most like undigital thing you could imagine. I sew rugs in my garage. I I create wooden cutting boards. Okay, like that's great, and I sell them all at like Saturday Market or something like that. And I'm thinking of expanding to a storefront. Well, that's great, but if somebody's even doing just that and and they don't even own a computer, I still would ask, like what are you missing by not being on Etsy or having a website where people can find you or even just know from your website very simply like where are you going to be selling these products I love them I saw you once at Saturday Market you weren't there the next week I wasn't sure where to find you uh, okay so you know the idea of kind of like going digital from day one I would I, I don't I wouldn't say I want to force everyone into that but I do want if you're feeling like I'm not the kind of person who would ever make a website for my own thing and therefore I'm just gonna you know I'm gonna sell by hand and do all this kind of work outside of that, I, I would maybe encourage people to really think about maybe even if it takes some of these funding uh, options that we're talking about here to get there, maybe consider how you might do that. You know, if you can hire like an outside freelancer, just how might you? And actually, that's going to be a great question. If you if you related to what I just said, then maybe that's a great question for the breakout session that we've got. How might you uh, borrow $20,000 in order to start a you know, the first time your first digital foray. And if you did that, what would you expect from a customer acquisition standpoint? Whew, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. And for some people, I know that that's overwhelming. Um, my wife is a English professor and author, and she hates the idea of having a website. And you guys, you, you never believe how much drama that causes on our house. I mean, all right. So anyway, so funding sources, again, we're in the kind of middle, the, the creamy middle of the sandwich here, the funding source. I'm so glad you spent a lot of time thinking about this last week. I know that what you saw, you know, it might have felt like a lot, but I actually want to really recommend that this tool is just an excellent way to start saying no to a lot of those options. Okay. That to me was like the coolest part about what Robert offered y'all is this opportunity to just say, 
cool. That's not for me. Because when it comes to who and, and, and what they're providing you, uh, the, the, the lender themselves are always thinking about their own capacity, their own timeline, their own requirements, but you have your input. Now that you have this forecast created, you have some requirements of your own. And so you want to start measuring the pros and cons of all the potential funding sources. But frankly, not everything is right for you, right? And so when Robert said, what funding source is right for you? If you can eliminate most options out there, you look at that big spreadsheet and you eliminate a ton of things that aren't appropriate for you. It's a great way <laughs> for you to know what, what sources might be available to me and what levels might be available to me. And you end up narrowing things down pretty quickly, okay? So again, if we look at this and it's like, oh my God, what is all this stuff? I don't know. Well, I might not want to pursue something that has a high cost of funds. So I'm eliminating all those. I might not want to pursue something that's only medium applicable to me. So now I've got only a few things and I say, well, okay, but you know, self-funding, friends and family, maybe I don't have any friends. Um, I'm not really interested in bootstrapping. I'm interested in taking on outside financing. So these first three are not for me. And now I've only got a few items left, okay? So again, this tool can be great if it felt like a lot of content that's, you know, honestly, let it, I think Robert said this last week, let it wash over you. <laughs> Understand that this can be something that you can talk about with other people. But if you're asking those kinds of questions, that's great. If I can help simplify, and, and hopefully this helps for those who are maybe felt like that was a lot of content last week, there's really only three basic ways of acquiring funding. Uh, one of them will be repaid with interest. So again, earlier I said, if somebody, if a bank or a lender or friends and family, hopefully in all cases, if you borrow from friends and family, you're gonna repay them plus some amount. And that's how they make money off the transaction. That's why they borrow, uh, that's why they bother in the first place. The second type, is where someone gives you some money and in exchange for that money, you give them a part stake in your business, partial ownership of some sort, angel investors, VCs, uh, an option we're gonna talk about later called Republic, uh, which are like crowd equity funding. Uh, those kinds of things all fall into this category. Um, and growth fail fueled by sales of your product, which we'll talk about kind of separately pre-sales. This is also sometimes called bootstrapping. And I won't critique the term, but the word bootstrapping was originally meant to mean something that is obviously impossible. So when we say bootstrapping and we mean something that's just difficult to do, I don't know. Listen, I'm a, I'm a word guy. I like using the correct language, but just know that bootstrapping is always meant to be pretty darn difficult and it's got its challenges along with it. So, you know, again, how much can you ask from, from each you know, let's say you've gone through that, that process with Robert. I actually didn't change this invoice factoring one. That can go up higher than I thought. Um, but you can use this sort of like sheet afterwards. You can kind of look this stuff on, online. This isn't a rare uh, sort of like breakdown here. But, you know, ultimately when you self-finance, you're ultimately limited by however much cash you actually have, how much you're making at any given time. Friends and family, honestly, sky's the limit. Uh, and, and I think we've all heard stories about people who were, you know, generational wealth and yeah, they made a startup, but their startup funding was $500,000, $5 million. And not all of us have access to that. But a lot of times you may be surprised if you reach out to your own large network and you need five or $10,000 to help stay in business, you might be able to find some support there. But as we move down this list, you know, invoice factoring, credit cards, that kind of thing, you can see the funding amounts ramp up all the way down to the bigger items here, really the two sort of like mega funding items SBA backed loans, especially the 504 loan, which is really meant for like buying an entire building, real estate or other major purchases, um, have a lot of requirements, but you can go up to 5 million. And then for anyone who's in that sort of fast growth startup phase, getting through your angel or seed investment phase and into venture capital and going into round A, round B, round C, that's where you get hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. And if that seems intimidating to you, and that seems like not something you might want in your life, good. Eliminate that from your list because only, you know, 0.01% of us are ever going to pursue that anyway. It's got a lot of heat around it. it. It gets a lot of news and stories and we see shows like Shark Tank and we think that there's a common approach, but that kind of equity funding is incredibly rare in terms of the overall business landscape of America. So feel free to say, no, that's not for me and you're good. Oh, Peter, question. I'm, I'm doing a time check-in. So we are at 10 and I know we have more information to go through. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to do a time check-in, see what we wanted to do. Um, the breakout activity is really good, you guys, because it really challenges your perceptions, your mind, your creativity. 
Um, so I do encourage you, even if we decide otherwise today, to do the breakout activity because it's going to be helpful. Um, but what would you like to do? Yeah, let me uh, let me do like uh, I'll do like five or ten minutes here, and then let's go to the breakouts because I do want to make sure we okay. have Q and A time as well. Uh, okay. And I do appreciate the the I mean the chat's awesome as well. So thanks for that. I keep. I keep trying to guide everything we're talking about here. Um, but yeah, we'll have these slides afterwards. So if I just talk really fast for the next five minutes, stay with me, but we can review this afterwards again, office hours on Friday. Um, you can see I changed the word bootstrapping to eat what you kill, which is I've gone from an impossible word to a really violent word, whatever, sorry. Um, but the pros here, you know, you can, you, you have less of a feeling of risk, you know, you're, you're kind of all alone, which can be really good. Um, and this idea of like growing in stealth mode, meaning like you don't have a lot of press, you don't have a lot of people looking at you if you're just slowly growing your business out of your garage. But of course the cons, you end up growing that much slower because you don't have this, you know, inventory influx or hiring influx, that kind of thing. You don't spike your growth. Um, and because you're alone, you might not have people who are feeling like committed to helping you. You might have good mentors, but you don't have when investors come in, people who really want to make sure that you succeed because their money's on the line as well. Um, and it's a little easier to steal your cool big idea if you're still small. A lot of times it's called a, a first mover advantage if you get to a fast growth phase earlier than your competitors because you've already reached your market. And so this is more like startup thinking. But if you're growing in stealth mode, a competitor might see what you're doing and just do exactly the same thing. And if you haven't grown to a certain degree, that might be easier for them. Okay, so equity, I'm not gonna spend any time on this. I'm gonna fly through these slides. So equity, the big difference here, uh, equity is the dark blue line. You go negative to get positive and you expect this kind of really fast growth. Whereas most American businesses do the lighter blue line where you kind of like, you know, grow uh, to a certain amount and kind of hit some kind of ceiling capacity, that kind of thing. If you're a restaurant, this curve goes a lot steeper and a lot more horizontal. If you are a consulting business, that kind of thing, you can imagine you've just got a certain number of clients that you can imagine ever reaching. And so you're never going to go hit this like super fast growth hockey stick kind of phase um, because, you know, frankly, it's not part of your goal set. If you're asking for equity investors, uh, angel investors, VCs, that kind of thing, the tips are really about. You know, don't ask for too much, but really don't ask for too little. When we talk about setting how much money you can get from these people, a lot of time the answer is how much are they willing to give you? Uh, you know, a, a VC is willing to give you, you know, something around the 20% uh, ratio. That means if you raise $3 million, they assume that you can eventually be valued at $15 million. That's very reasonable. But again, in the angel sort of like grant early stage thinking, like, you know, something you might get from a accelerator and incubator. Sometimes uh, if I look at like Portland Angel or Portland Seed Fund, their, their amount is 25K. And if you can get that, great, but you don't really negotiate with them. It's just built into how they operate. So really, again, you've got your forecast. You're going to think about what's possible. But in this space, VCs, angels, all these equity investors, things become a little bit different than with other types of investments. Um, they expect you to enter this uh, you know, we call it the valley of death down here uh, because that's where you go negative in terms of the, the amount of cash that you're making. You're usually trying to acquire customers so fast that you're overpaying for them. And then you enter this fast growth phase. But again, this is for such a minority of businesses that I don't want to talk about it too much. But the exception to this uh, is new really to the world because of regulations being changed over the last, uh, well, about, about five years ago at this point, but regulations were changed significantly uh, to the idea of crowdfunding and the idea that other people can participate in equity. Uh, and if anyone from Rain wants to chime in, but I know you guys have a partnership with a particular equity crowdfunding platform called Republic. And this is a great opportunity if you're thinking about early stage funding or some kind of growth-based funding to do something like a Kickstarter, but make sure that, but, but you actually, instead of getting just money for product delivered or just, you know, donations, you actually are doing an equity uh, financing event and, you know, you can succeed or fail within that sort of uh, sure. time frame. Yeah. Peter, I can uh, jump in since that's my, Please. that's my, my gig. Nathan here, I'm the capital access director uh, for Rain, And my charge is to help connect Rain companies, people who are in our orbit, in our service, involved with our services to this uh, funding source. There's two ways to do it. And I won't get into great detail, but there's 
equity crowdfunding where you can essentially you know, bring, a, bring in many, many shareholders. Republic provides the service of aggregating all of those people together so that you just have one unit of stock, if you will, that goes out to um, these shareholders and Republic manages the communication, et cetera. So that's for equity. The other side of things that they do that we offer is a revenue-based loan, which is um, uh, a, a straight up loan, as you would imagine, um, any sort of loan, but it's based, the repayment is based on a percentage of your revenues in the future. So rather than um, it just being a straight term loan, it's based on revenues so that the um, investors get a little bit higher return than they would if they were um, just doing a straight term loan, but they also get, it also can give you opportunity to access funds for a year before you have to start repaying. So it's some interesting opportunities, ways to fund your business differently. Um, I would be happy to talk with any of you about that um, at a later date, but that's kind of what we do with Republic. They provide the services, we at Rain help prepare you to go out and engage with them. Um, Nathan, can you write down your email over there so that people can ask you questions if they have? I will put it in the chat. Thank you. And if you guys have questions about this, you can ask them and let's take advantage of the fact that Nathan is here. here. Yeah. Thank Love you. It. And I see Dante's hand up. Uh, if you had a quick question, we can address that. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, Nathan, your opinion on doing a um, reward space crowdfunding campaign uh prior to doing an equity uh to sort of get your crowd lined up before you actually go into the equity raise and what your opinion was on that dante that is a great point um that is exactly sort of how you manage this process you need a crowd of people that are going to come and support your venture whether it's um a rewards base right where i buy a pro i pre-purchase a product or get a t-shirt or whatever because i'm supporting your idea that's good to do first. In fact, that shows traction and interest in your product and or service that lets that makes you more investable. Right. And so that's a great way to go to get yourself sort of bootstrapped up. And if you, you know, if you, if you do it well, you can launch a company with a Kickstarter campaign and then grow that company with an equity based crowdfunding campaign. So same idea though, it's not just a matter of getting your um, offering out there on the interwebs for anybody to invest in. It's like, you've got to build your own community of people that are going to invest in you as you launch this thing. So that's a really key point, but great question, Dante. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. And, and again, just, just to like, and I've seen a lot of great tips here in the chat. So I just, yeah, yeah. I echo everything in there, uh, build your list. Yes. Especially, um, it, but yes, the difference here that we're talking about, normal Kickstarter where you essentially, uh, you know, pre-purchase products, that's like a special way of, of bootstrapping, right? You're, you're essentially pre-selling your products, but you still have to deliver the product or service afterwards. Now, uh, the idea of doing um, the, uh, the sort of uh, equity funded like Republic offers uh, is, is also an option here. So anyway, um, okay, cool. I see there's a poll here as well. <laughs> um, the other, you know, the major type of the most famous, I guess, type of, uh, of lending that you can achieve that's that's debt based is, is going to come from banks. Um, there's a lot of other options online. And again, if you're going to use something like a, uh, let's say, a, 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 what, are, what are some of the examples, uh, uh, the sort of like short term lending that you can find online on deck cabbage, that kind of thing. Or any sort of like invoice factoring, really be careful with those, you know, maybe meet with somebody either who has experience with that. But ultimately, when it comes to like bank back loan, SBA back loans, uh, yeah, cabbage, pay, all those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to these bank back loans, you know, a lot of times these are just your best and safest options if you need the money and you can qualify for it. Um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, if you do, then this is really where that that having that initial baseline forecast, your growth based forecast, you're going to want to bring that to the bank. And frankly, you know, like, like I said, we make a product called Live Plan. One of the only reasons I ever recommend creating a longer form business plan with like text and all that kind of thing is if somebody specifically is asking for it. And a lot of times somebody is somebody like a bank or a lender. So, okay, cool. So how do we make sure that we've got success here? And I, I um, you know, again, we've come back to this whole 
three-step process here, the, the need case, the funding source, the success model. Um, so now we're going to start thinking about that success model. How do you recognize and track success? How do you know that you use the money wisely? And this comes right back to that idea of not, you know, let's not run out of cash. Let's not dive into something that we're, we're making sure. You, that's why you've made that forecast in the first place. But you can outpace, you can do statistically better than those people who have failed because of cash flow issues by using your forecast in an iterative way, a lean way, which means coming back to it over and over again. The way that you come back to a forecast is you put a guess out there in the world, the forecast itself, because everyone here who ever makes a forecast is always gonna be wrong about the future. You're gonna measure how wrong you were about the future. You say, hey, I thought I was gonna be making you know, 500K in customer sales by the end of this month. And in fact, I only made 499. 401, whatever, that's your measurement. Your guess is, is not perfect. And you're going to measure that again. What's what actually happened. And you're going to ask yourself or work with your mentor or consultant, co-founders, whoever you've got to ask why that difference is there. And that way, when you build that forecast again, when you come back and revise that forecast, again, if you remember, I say to keep your forecast as simple as you can. So all these line items, so you're not a hundred line items here. So when you revise it, you can actually do it. Uh, then you build again and you come back to this, maybe in a monthly sort of cycle. And especially if you've got near-term financing or you're in a startup phase, you might do this pretty frequently, okay? So just remember, anytime you guess about the future, you're just using your best knowledge to think about what you think might happen. Even if you're really quite accurate, if you've been up and running for years, you still wanna have that in mind. So then this also applies if you've just taken in funding. If I just got a loan, if I've just gotten some investment of some sort, I want to make sure I'm tracking exactly where that funding is spent and whether those goals that I set in that second forecast are being met. And understand that the world will change. You might have had a really aggressive goal and you didn't meet it one month. It doesn't mean you just give up, of course. It also doesn't mean you just wake up every day and say, well, I have to work harder. That's also not really that intelligent a way to go about it. So come in with more of that sort of adjusted forecast and figure out how you might be able to do this. Looks like Ken's good at the crowdfunding thing, by the way, that's an awesome little background there. Um, so, and then the learning part of this is equally as important. Ask yourself why you didn't achieve what you thought you would, uh, make sure you adjust over time. Uh, the comic I like to share here is on the day of my loan, if the puppy at the top right, and then the puppy, or the top left and the puppy at the top right are my first eight weeks, and I'm like, okay, great. Well, now I'm making a forecast and I'm never going to look back. I mean, how many people have ever done this in your lives? You've created a budget in January. Let's say two and a half years ago, you created a budget in January. And, uh, and wow, you know, things sure did change. And your, your puppy might not look like you thought it was going to look like. That's why you have to adjust to not get these ridiculous, these cartoonishly incorrect assertions. Don't stick with a forecast just because you made it. Make sure to be able to flex, be flexible and adjust. And if you can compare it to your actuals, okay? And what I mean there is, you know, in an app like LivePlan, if you've got your um, cash flow, you've got your balance sheet here, you can also say, okay, great. Well, I want to import my accounting data and just see how I'm doing. When I say, uh, you know, I thought I would do this well, how much, how am I stacking up against how reality actually treated me? This is in the app, but if you're doing this on your own, or again, on a whiteboard, it might be just as easy for you, depending on the complexity of your business. So that's how you get to that last step and actually learn from it. So yeah, back to Annie's like question minutes ago, am I asking you to make multiple forecasts? Yes, I am unfortunately gonna do that. And I'm also asking you to revise your forecast over time. I want that to feel maybe like it feels like a lot, but I also want you to spend the least amount of time to get through this process so you can get back to work and make it relevant and lean. So uh, that's kind of the end of just me talking nonstop here. I, I'd be happy to do breakout groups or um, we can just try to apply this to some other cases as well. Uh, Annie, maybe uh, based on what you heard out there, happy to do either one. And yeah, um, so we got 35 people that answered. Um, we got 55 here apparently. Um, oh, it doesn't include us. Okay. Um, so mostly <clears throat> we got 83% want to skip the breakout session and 17% want to continue with the presentation and do a Q and A. All right. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> great. Well, 
Oh wait, so skip the breakout session, do the thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I mean, we we can just dive right into Q and A. Um, I can also just use these cases as a way of describing some of the things you all might have been coming up with on your own. But Annie, what do you say? Let, let's just talk through what I was hoping for in the breakout room because I think you can still do this. Yes. Inside your inside your mind palace, open up your brains, and and my assignment to you is to come up with some way, like what would be a future that isn't probably something that you might pursue, but what would be a future where you might pursue a type of financing or funding that is different from whatever you're currently planning? What kind of future might that be? And actually let's, let's use these cases to kind of like reflect on what that might mean to you, because I think sometimes people are, you're, 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 you're committed to what you're doing and you're so committed to it that what I just asked you might take a lot of imagination, okay? So, well, what's a case here? So let's talk about a startup case, okay? Like, you know, again, this is that traditional, like maybe this person would go on Shark Tank or, you know, pitch on stage and this kind of thing. But let's say they're selling a blood glucose kit at home. Uh, they've got a testing kit and they want to, they want they want a monthly uh, sort of sales here and they've got a forecast and and they've got an equity person who comes in and says, listen, if you can meet these year one goals that you've set for yourself, then in year two, we're going to come in with a lot of money and we're going to fund a fast growth phase. So if I come back to the steps I set out earlier, the first step would just be making that baseline forecast. Even businesses like Uber, Twitter, I don't know about Facebook, but definitely Uber, Twitter, Mint, you know, they produced, for their initial investors, they still produced a working business model that showed that they could be profitable, even though eventually they went into these non-profitable, these unprofitable ways of uh, uh, doing their business because they got so much funding. So let's say this business created its forecast and they said, great, here it is. This is a reasonable thing that I could do without a ton of investment. Again, that's step one that we all want to pursue if we were going to do this on our own. Um, and, and yes, yeah, said, so isn't VC a rare type? Yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be a rare case and probably not something that most people will pursue here. Um, so they get this baseline forecast and you can see they've got, you know, 544,000 in year four, which is, a, you know, a fairly good business. And then they create the second forecast and they say, great, if I can get that investment in year two and I can meet that customer goal in year one, then my forecast would actually grow up to be a much larger number. And this is that second forecast that they would produce. So now they've got the answers to some of these smart questions. With the seed, $1 million, year two, the margin grows from, the goal grows from 500K to 5 million. They can monitor their KPIs, their key performance indicators. They can monitor their customer acquisition and their churn rate, which is uh, specific to subscription, since this is a box subscription. Um, they're going to work with their startup advisor. They're going to make sure that they're able to do this, that, that their mentality is, is, is able to accept this kind of investment, that they know that they can deliver these kinds of products over time. And then the time bound part, again, comes from the investor a little bit here, right? If they achieve something in year one, then by year two, they'll actually receive this investment and they can make this growth happen. So that's how we applied this company, those SMART goals. But again, this is like that, that VC case. Again, we like to talk about this kind of stuff a lot, but it's fairly rare. So maybe let's bring up something that feels a little bit more, uh, again, creative. I, people don't like to talk about negative cases a lot of the times, but I actually, I love the idea that sometimes this can make you feel more confident. So what if, I don't know if you all have been keeping up with crab news, but there's been a bunch of algae issues out there I've heard. And sometimes crab season changes and the price of the market changes. So what if I said, okay, well, I think mid mid season next year i think that there might be this algae issue and i'm going to my seafood export business is going to have a serious problem for 4 months i'm going to have a serious delivery issue and i i think according to my first forecast i think i might actually run out of cash and if that's the case i want to figure out what i can do to bridge that to bridge loan to come up with some kind of debt maybe even if it's a friends and family solution maybe i've got an uncle who's willing to give me i don't know $20,000 but i need to know the number Okay, so again, back to that model that we talked about. I'm going to create my normal forecast. This is without any crisis. And you can see right here, I've already got a cash on hand forecast for my existing and up and running business of only having a, a, almost like $1,600 here for a given month in the future. Okay, well, that's, that's not a lot. Like that's pretty razor thin. We're, we're getting tight here. 
So I'm going to say, okay, well, with this crab crisis in place, I see now that I've got, you know, uh, I'm in the negative here. This is where I'm not making payroll or not making my bills. I'm not paying my bills at this point. I might go out of business. My business might fail here in July if I don't figure out how to bridge these negative numbers. So I can really just add these up and say, that's the amount that I need to borrow in order not to completely fail, in order not to go out of business. So in this case, I will make that second, I, I've got my second forecast and I know the amount that I need to borrow in order to come back to baseline, right? So it's a very different approach if we think this way. If we think about kind of that worst case scenario, the approach, the time bound element comes specifically from that seasonality, right? I'm, the, the time bound element is forced upon me. It's not really an option I have to explore. Crab season doesn't change if I want it to. The relevance is, is handed to me also. The relevance is, do I want to stay in business or not? And if so, then I need this option to be available to me. The attainable part kind of becomes a question. Um, not all types of lending options are, are quick enough or interested enough in just keeping you in business. So again, let's say in this case, our confidence is high. Maybe I could invest my own money or friends and family, or I, or I know of a lending source or some sort of invoice factoring source that might provide this that I trust. So that's a great use of that. Um, and again, the measurable piece, you know, really we're trying to return ourselves to baseline, not come up with a new business model. So in that case, this type of new and unexpected financing for this company might become part of their optional business model, a way to stay in business, a way to borrow 10K and, and crab another day, uh, as, as they'll put it, let's say. Um, and then one more chance here, one more expansion opportunity and something it, I would hope maybe some of you all might come up with in, in your own breakout sessions. Uh, let's say I run a therapy center um, and I find out that the building next door, uh, who's, you know, maybe it's owned by a friend or I know them, and I find out it might be for sale soon. So now I'm starting this planning process, this unexpected planning process of borrowing $2 million for the first time ever in my business, which seems like a lot. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. How would I approach that process? Well, I've got my need case, uh, my funding sources. If I use, you know, Robert sheet, I've, I've narrowed down funding sources to only a couple, <laughs> you know, so I've got like bank loans, I've got 504 SBA loans, uh, that kind of thing. I've really only got a couple options and my success model I'm going to start thinking about this, but now I'm going to need to forecast this other scenario. But my success model is get that new space, pay for it, pay off the, the loan every month, start the build out process, but hopefully double the capacity I have. So I'm doubling space. But since this is a therapy center, the number of offices and the number of people working in those offices is equivalent to my revenue or is related directly to my revenue, if that makes sense. OK, so that's the case that we're working with. Let's say I'm looking at this baseline forecast. And again, I've gone through this work. If you were in your breakout sessions, you'd be able to write down probably two numbers. So now we've got a little bit more complicated version of this. So I've got my, my net profit already worked out. You can see here, it's like $65,000 in next year. That's just what I'm forecasting. This is an up and running business and we're doing pretty well. When I create that growth potential, the post loan, after the loan comes in and the employees come in and the space comes in, you can see here next year, I've gone from 65,000 net profit to 73,000 net profit. And I said I was doubling my capacity and my sales and everything like that. Does anyone wanna like unmute or chat or let me know what happened here with this forecast? Is this unexpected or expected for you? This is actually modeled on a, a real business expansion just for those who. Don't yeah, know. I think that's more realistic on the second slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it, it does. It's, it's about a reality check here. So the reality check is, in fact, the net profit doesn't increase dramatically. It definitely doesn't double because, yeah, the cost of the money. So me repaying the loan is now a factor in the expenses. Uh, the new employees. In this case, the co-founder, actually the, the owner of the business gave themselves a raise if they get this money. She was making far too little actually. So it was a, a more sustainable salary for her as the founder. Uh, so again, and all the supplies that go into this new space and the build out mean that the resulting net profit is not a great amount of growth. 
And that's interesting. So that's very measurable. And that becomes an interesting way of approaching this. Well, the funding is clear. Again, we've got very few options. Those options, by the way, SBA backed loans, 504 loans have, have, a, have very specific requirements. I think right now it's two years in business and over 500K in last year's revenue or both years revenue. I think that's right. We can double check that. Um, but is this attainable? That's what's going to be the, the requirements are going to decide that question. Is it relevant? Yeah. I mean, she wants to expand. Let's say this business owner wants to expand. She wants to grow this business and this is spot on with her goals and she can do it. She can, she knows the people she's going to hire. She already knows their name. So is this a strategic decision or is this an opportunistic response? And I mean, drop in chat, whatever you think, because this is, this is a true case. This is a real thing that's actually happened, but you know, some people critique to this person for saying, well, you just, you saw an opportunity and you took it. This wasn't a part of your overall strategy. And, you know, she responded, no, this is what I've always wanted. <laughs> this is in fact, my, my ultimate goal with this business. And that's great. So that personality component, again, this, co this owner's co personality is what drove the decision to be made. But from your opinion, yeah, it could be both I see as a response. This could be something, th this kind of thinking is exactly how you would then have to apply this to your own case. Would I, would I care to go through all this trouble to expand just to make more revenue? So before we were looking at net profit, yeah, now she's getting paid more, you know, maybe, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, there's a lot of considerations here. So before she was making more net profit, but her business indeed has doubled in revenue in space. And I mean, she is paying off the loan successfully. So there's nothing really wrong. There's no crisis here, but there's also twice as much day-to-day -day management. She has twice Peter, as much personnel. Yes. Can I, can I give an input? Um, yeah, please. We have a family run business and, and the property that we use is owned by my mother-in-law. And, and when my father-in-law passed away, I told her, I have a, a long history in finance and investments. I told her I can sell everything, pay the capital gains and get you the same amount of net money that you want. And she goes, yeah, but I won't employ 45 to 55 people. I won't provide a service to the community. I'll have the same amount of money, but I won't have all these other things that kind of I've appreciated doing and building this business. So sometimes it's not just about money. It's about creating a job for another person or providing a service for other people. Exactly. And, and everything you just said, when I talk about entrepreneurial personality, everything you just said falls right into that. What do you really want to do with this business? In this case, for this person, she, like I said, she knew the people that she was going to fill these empty seats with. She knew them by name. She was going to hire them, hopefully, as soon as she could. So yeah, Ron, to your point, this was her goal all along. So the fact that now she's managing a staff that's twice as big, which might feel intimidating to some people, the fact, you know, that you have all these other expenses and someone asked, you know, what is the loan term? I believe it was 20 years on that $2 million space. And she actually funded, by the way, I think it was around 400 K of it herself out of her own money. So she became more invested in this business. Again, those things might feel daunting, intimidating to somebody who felt like the business is running just fine before. But Ron, to your point, if your ultimate goal, and you hear this a lot with nonprofits, my ultimate goal, I want to serve as many kids as I can because any kid who needs this kind of help uh, deserves it. And oh my God, now you you expand at all at, at all safe venture at all safe venues. You you expand as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. But again, this is not for everyone, and that's why this becomes a sort of like a decision, a conclusion that you should make about your own business. And that's why what my challenge is to y'all is just to be creative about this. So again, we're, yeah, I guess we're skipping the breakout activity, but I think maybe you can take home from those cases, how you might've thought about this on your own. I do want you, I challenge you all to just do the exact same activity that we described in your head on paper, come up with a reason that you might not, that, that might be surprising to you to ask for financing in the future, something that you're not currently planning for already. Try to come up with it, whatever it might be, a new type of subscription. Maybe you launch a, a YouTube channel uh, that trains uh, people to do the kind of thing that you do one-on-one -on -one or something like that. So consider that. If you make food, you know, could you distribute into grocery stores nationally? What would that look like? And what kind of financing might that take? So have that fun part on your own. I'll be in office hours on Friday. We can get creative then. Uh, and I'll answer any questions, of course. It looks like we've got a lot of 
Awesome thoughts, by the way. I love the chat. Uh, just keep it going. I know I missed like 20 questions here. Happy to chat over email. I'll see you in office hours, I hope. Thank Annie, you, Peter. I, um, I did write down all of the questions that you guys asked that weren't answered. So we do have that record over there. Um, thank you everybody for connecting today. We really appreciate your presence here and we hope that this was very useful for you. We'll see you on Friday and I will stay here for about 15 minutes in case you guys have any questions or would like to discuss anything. Thank you, Peter, again, great presentation. Absolutely. And just a couple of questions about the live plan accounts. We can set those up by email. So we'll just use your name and email to set you up with your access code. So feel Thanks free to a lot. love it. Yeah, we love what Rain does and we want to keep supporting you in whatever way we can. It's very small. <laughs> whatever ways we can now. That's good. People, we, we have really good feedback. Thank over you, here. Peter. Don't Thank you, Peter. Great. This has been great, Peter. I've been I've seen you before. I was in Roger Wong's class uh, last year for the business plan class. So you're just on point as before. So thank you very much. Peter, you're muted. Oh no, I, I did the muted thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, whoever uh, mentioned Roger Wong, I you know that's where Robert used to work as well. If you're not aware, Rain just keeps scooping up all the all the great talent in all of Oregon. I love to see all of y'all here. It's amazing. I it's you know i feel like it's becoming just a, a star-studded staff here <laughs> oh yeah making the best team ever um Dante, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question yes you you were going to uh share with us how we are doing and how we can catch up and all of those uh tips in terms of how we could assess where we are at at the at this stage and i was just looking forward to that Is that for Annie or for me? Oh, that, that's for Annie. Sorry. No, no, good. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Yeah, you mentioned earlier that you were going to uh, talk about uh, how we could, uh, <laughs> I guess, review where we are at right now with our responses and our notes oh, no. and all of that stuff. That is correct. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you guys um, a spreadsheet where you can see how many um, sessions you have attended and how many of the take out, take away forms you have submitted. So that way you guys are, you know, in tune with where you're at and what you need to do in order to catch up. Um, the pitch submission is not required to receive a certificate of completion. It is really good practice for your business and there are actual prices. Um, this is actually the pitch that we've had the most amount of resources to give to you guys. So it's very exciting. Um, Robert and I are planning on how we're gonna distribute uh, the prices itself. And we'll give you guys more information on that uh, when we define everything. And yeah, I think that's about it. All right, Philip, feel free to unmute. Yeah, so when are we gonna be actually doing the pitch? When is the last, is the actual graduation? You talked about October 5th, is that when that happens? Yes, the graduation okay. is on October 5th. And the way that we do with the pitches is you guys submit it. We select the top seven. And we showcase that at graduation. And we have an audience vote, as well as a few uh, like CEO choices or things like that. So uh, you guys are going to be part of it as well. And the idea here is um, to learn from each other, to practice how you present your business. And uh, are there angel investors attending? Not necessarily to do an investment, but we will have angels investors that are attending. Um, it's not the main, uh, let's say, it's not the main purpose of the graduation to connect you guys with angel investors per se. Um, but yeah, and actually the, the keynote speaker is an angel investor himself. He's part of the Oregon Venture Fund and the, 
I don't want to say the name wrong, an, another uh, um, investment fund uh, here in Oregon. Anything else? Peter, any comments, any, any um, tips you could give somebody that is working on their pitch? I just put you on the spot and you don't have to answer because I didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you that. It's just, it just occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I have tons, I uh, could spend hours talking about it. I mean, but the main thing is, is uh, I, I even sometimes give students like a little fill in the blanks worksheet. Like the reason I've done that before and a lot of, I've seen this from a lot of investment firms too, you know, early on, you know, make sure to say all of the most relevant elements of your business so that people know what you're talking about. One of the things I, I see really commonly and I absolutely hate from a pitch is if you've got 30 seconds or five minutes, I don't care how long, if I'm halfway into it and I don't even really understand what your business is or what you sell or what you're doing out there, I, it's, you give people a chance to zone out, to start looking at their phone and to, to start having arguments with you so the fill in the blanks thing I like to say is like, you know, blank is a blank who sells blank to blank who need blank and don't get it from blank. Could be your first sentence. You could say, hi, I'm Peter. And I, you know, work at, I work at a company that produces LivePlan. LivePlan is a software that's sold online as a subscription service. We sell it to entrepreneurs who need to think about their future and guess about their future and apply for loans and, and get funding. Uh, and they don't get that from, uh, they don't get what they need from Microsoft Word and Excel right? Very simple. Now I can go in to have fun. I can talk about myself. I can talk about details, but the audience is not going to be lost. <laughs> Wondering why I've been talking about how thick the human skull is for five minutes, Nathan. That was a, one of your uh, <laughs> NBC people. Literally, we had to interrupt them three minutes in and say, you've talked about the human skull now in the history for minutes. And it was a great product, but it was about drilling a hole in the skull. Yeah. And we're like, could you have just told us? <laughs> That's all we wanted to know. Help There's me understand there. early. Yeah. <laughs> Help them get there. Yeah. There's one more hand up. Philip? I have one more hand. Let's see. Oh, I think it still fills. All right. It's a high five at this point. <laughs> okay. I was supposed, to, I meant to remove that. But anyway, I will say, since I do have the opportunity, that I did choose to subscribe to live plan and, and start working the program before the offer came up. And that's fine because it's been absolutely essential for me to start organizing the whole concept of what I really want to do. So once again, everything that Oregon Rain is doing has just been absolutely essential for me to see a way forward. Got a lot of questions. We'll talk on Friday as well as with others here, but uh, yeah, live plan really really worked. So there's my lower hand. There it is. Great. Yeah, that's that was more than a high five. <laughs> I do. Uh, high five on the forehead. <laughs> I see a few questions about just making sure I get the activations and everything like that. So we'll do that over email. All I need is, you know, name and email uh, and we'll do that. So I've got a few people who have messaged me that if you already have an account, we'll extend it by three months. So that's all we need to do that. And uh, thanks for those who've already sent that. But Afterwards, email is just as good. Thanks, y'all. Hey, Peter, can I ask oh. one more question quick? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that when I was working in the corporate world, I used to pad my numbers by 20% because telling them the truth was, was uh, frowned upon. But in the real world, I want to be honest. And I was wondering if I always pad them within the, the the numbers or should I create a line item saying, hey, for contingencies and, you know, stuff happens kind of thing, I'm going to add a 20% premium on top of what I'm asking. I, I love this question. I, I <laughs> It's something I don't like to bring up on my own, but it, yeah. The, so <laughs> I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of folks, especially like who, who might be applying for equity investment, who are like, it just feels like I'm like, I'm making up the best case scenario. Like I'm almost feel like I'm lying. Like this is so positive. I'm not showing any of my fears. I'm not showing any of my concerns. I'm just showing the, the absolute best thing I could ever imagine happening. And yeah, you are like, yes, 
You are, and I want to encourage that. But a lot of times what makes people feel more comfortable with that is they make another forecast that's really like for management. Like you said, like the one that really like they really think is more realistic, that feels more like what the day-to-day -day will actually look like, maybe includes some like negative things that might happen. But sometimes when you're presenting to somebody, especially for funding or financing, equity financing, that kind of thing, you do want to show them this golden vision of the future. And again, if it makes you uncomfortable to say like, it almost feels like I'm lying, like it's so positive, <laughs> then yeah, I do recommend just keep a, keep a special you know, forecast just for yourself that makes you feel good about. You know. I think that there are two ways, right? On one hand, people think, oh, you're just a dreamer and you don't have a foot in the reality. Or some people might say, hey, this person really knows because, you know, stuff happens, for example, uh, you know, what's happening with, with China and Taiwan or what's happening in this and your supply chain gets screwed up, your gas prices are going high up. Those are the reality. And so your raw material cost can swing 20% up. I mean, you look at lumber, every day the price are changing. So is it, wouldn't it, uh, so my thinking is, wouldn't it be realistic to say, hey, it's likely that the they stuff happens in the world and that's why I'm going to add 20% as a, as a contingency. And then they will appreciate saying, hey, this guy is on the ground. He's not, you know, flying at 30,000 30, foot. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it can kind of go both ways. Yeah. It, it, it ultimately really depends on what the purpose, if you're going to show, if you're ever going to show a forecast to anyone, yeah, think of their purpose, right? Like what are their goals in working with you? And sometimes people want to see hockey stick growth, that kind of thing. They want to see these like really like what could this possibly be visions? And to your point, though, if you talk to them and you get that they don't want that, you know, a lot of like, you know, later stage, like those bank loans, the one I was talking about with that real estate, they don't want to see the same thing an equity investor would want to see. Yeah, They want to see the most realistic they want to show that you're in control of reality, that you understand really what all the things that might happen are, and that you understand all of the influencers and cost factors, everything that might affect this, this process when it really happens. So they don't want this fantasy vision <laughs> that again, like a VC does want to see. Uh, so, you know, that, yeah, you have to balance kind of your own perceptions, your own comfort level with the expectations and what, what the lender wants to see really especially if you're going to show it to somebody else. Yeah, the more that you can know about them, the better. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so there are a few comments over here on the, ca on, on the cast, on the chat. Um, um, they've been using some Monte Carlo simulations to run different uh, forecasts and different probabilities. So, yeah. That's another tool that you guys have under your belt now. Annie, is there a uh, is there a freeware version of that or online version? Let's see. Let me check. I mean, but you <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I I assume you can do all of those different forecasts with life plans though, right? Yeah, you absolutely can. And, and I think, you know, Michael actually had a good point here too, which is, you know, sometimes those kinds of like, like, uh, you know, the Monte Carlo approach is, is interesting and it kind of provides you some parameters to think about. Um, and so it can be a great way to almost like kick off <laughs> the type of forecast or some of the parameters of the forecast you might make. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a fun way of going about things. Um, and, you know, can open your mind to different approaches of thinking, but yeah. Uh, I, and I think and yeah, you can find tools. it online. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering in the, in the rain tool chest, is there a, if there is a version that we all can use? Yeah. Um, so I just did a quick search online and, and there are different places where you can just access it. Um, okay. I mean, since you guys are going to be having some life plan uh, access, I would just do every possible case scenario. <clears throat> I was very skeptical every time I showed my business plan and people would tell me, you need to plan for one or two years of expenses. And I was like, why? 
you know, most of the people that I've talked to have told me that they've been at least able to sustain their store in six months, but they didn't open in a pandemic or in a moment in the, which the economy just went crazy. So there was a different aspect that I needed to prepare for. And, but I, I, I just had another job to have that financial stability, but I didn't believe it when people would tell me plan for your expenses for at least two years. And now I do, I believe it. <laughs> Run. Uh, so I'm a little bit confused. Peter, do you want us to email you individually for access to live plan? Or is Ani gonna send out a link to reach you? How's that gonna work? Yeah, Ani, what, Ani, what do you prefer there? Cause yeah, I'm happy to just receive. Ani, I mean, really all I need is name and email. So anyone who requests it. Um, I, I think I think we can do, um, I, I can provide you with those things. And then that way, uh, you guys can manage all of that. Because mm -hmm. I'm in, just I don't want to miss out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it doesn't matter. I just I need the same info if you've you know never subscribed or if you already have an account. We'll just use your name and email to to. Link I just up. need to know if any of you used a different email to register for money maker. Button Let me know because then that, that that could be the only issue that I can foresee. If you have already an account and you used a different email, let me know so that I can update that information. Kathy, you have a question. Oh yeah, I wanted to know what business did you have, um, and uh, are you transitioning into a new one? I have some ideas for you. <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> no, no, I'm talking to uh, uh, Annie. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you ask me again? I was reading the message on the chat. Sorry. Oh no problem. Um, I says, what kind of business were you in? And I think you said you might be transitioning to a new business. Um, well, I got an idea for you. So I just, to, what's, your, what's your next um, step? Yeah. I, I had um, um, a retail store and a production studio where I made uh, jewelry and apparel. And I had other brands, mostly women owned and a storefront on Alberta street in Portland. I am taking, a, I'm, I'm calling myself a recovery entrepreneur and I'm not really pursuing anything right now other than my consulting and and continue to help small business owners okay thanks in in assessing actually like i i, I just discovered my niche um and it is helping people um figure out if opening a brick and mortar store makes sense what the numbers say and what the possibilities are and just do a reality check about that Kind of using my experience for something. Okay, and so everybody that needs to take off, you're good to go. We actually went over uh, a little bit than the time I told you we were gonna stay over here. Uh, once again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me and we will keep you posted with the access to life plan as well as the pitch prices and all of those things. Mm -hmm.